It all started three years ago. I was driving upstate to visit my sister who had just had her second kid the month before. I had been working on a project for school when she went into labor and I had been promising to come visit her ever since I missed the birth. It was a long drive, but I didn't mind it. Driving through random towns, stopping at unfamiliar restaurants and gas stations, it was like visiting a new country that wasn't that different from your own. One of my favorite things was when you found a nice trucker's gas station. They had more food options, weird little aisles of stuff meant for people spending a lot of time out on the road, and big bathrooms with air dryers and spacious stalls. I'd stopped at one of those because I was hungry and needed to pee. There wasn't anything special about it, other than it looked new and brightly lit compared to the other stations off that exit. I got some gas and went inside, heading straight back to the bathrooms with the quick step of someone who really needs to go. It was one of those bathrooms without doors that I liked so much, just a twisting path of walls for privacy instead of germy handles and awkward exchanges with people trying to get back out. Making my way back around the last corner, I found the urinals and started to pee. It was then I stared at the wall in front of me that I noticed the writing. The walls were made up of large brown tiles further down, but at chest height and up, the tiles were smaller and more varied. Rectangles lined up in neat little rows. Some were smooth and bulged out like glass or some kind of jewel or green or blue or white, while the neighbors were flat and mainly a muted gray and black, like bits of rock or slices from a chalkboard. The darker bits were covered with writing. A hundred tiny messages from people that had journeyed through this place before me and wanted to leave behind some sign of their passing or some important piece of advice. Things like bull's rule, for example, or that Amber is a slut. There were messages that were funny, some that were hateful, and others that were just bizarre. Stranger still was that this gas station, which really did seem to be new and well-maintained, had so much graffiti in the first place. But it's as I had that thought that I saw it, right in front of my eyeline. A small, simple phrase that stood out in part because it didn't seem like an insult or a boast or a declaration. It was a greeting. Hi, Pete. I blinked and read it again, feeling a strange sense of unreality as I studied the two words neatly scratched into the dark stone. The phrase itself was slightly odd, but obviously the bigger reason it caught my attention was because it said my name, like the wall was talking to me, saying hello. I should have left it alone, of course. I'd never felt the slightest urge to leave a message on a wall anywhere. I'm very big on leaving other people's property alone, but something... I don't know. I've always liked driving through new places, like I said, but it kind of feels lonely, doesn't it? In some ways, that's a good feeling. The feeling of something too hot or too cold or too whatever right before it goes from being interesting to being painful. A quiet little adventure where anything could happen, but nothing ever will. But that loneliness is also a bit sad. And I'd be lying if I didn't admit that when I saw my name scratched into the wall, I felt a little like finding a message in a bottle that was addressed to me. As dumb as it sounds, pissing in the urinal, feeling tired and a little down, seeing that high peat made me a bit excited and happy. When I zipped up, instead of heading to the sink, I dug into my pocket for a dime I thought was still there for my last stop. Heart pounding, I glanced around to make sure the bathroom was still empty before I leaned forward to scratch a quick reply in the empty space below the greeting. Hi. The doll was small, of course, but hard enough to bite into the stone easily. It took only a few seconds to scratch the two letters in, and it wasn't until I was finishing the exclamation point that my hand froze mid-scratch. Or, not really my entire hand, just my fingertips that were touching the wall. The edge of my index finger and the nail there, and then the tip of my thumb. They were stuck, like the stone had suddenly turned to glue or fast-drying cement, and when I tried to yank my hand away, I let out a yell at the pain that flared out of my trapped fingertips. 
Another couple of panicked yanks told me I wasn't going to get free easily, though for some reason the dime had dropped free from between my stuck fingers without any issue. I watched forlornly as it bounced twice and rolled under a stall before turning back to my hand and sucking in a deep breath. I needed to calm down. It was a gas station bathroom. No telling what kind of gross, sticky shit that was in there, right? I just needed to grab my fingers with the other hand and gently pull away from the wall. A couple of minutes later, I was sweating and starting to give into a new wave of panic. My fingers weren't budging. I tried pulling and twisting, using a key and a car to pry them loose. Nothing worked. And I was running out of things to try. As embarrassing as it all was, I was starting to wish someone would come into the bathroom to help me, but there'd been no sign of anyone. Swallowing, I tried to think of another way to help myself, and I grimaced at the idea that popped in my head. (sighs) Pushing the manual flush on the urinal, I cupped my hand at the stream of water coming from the top. It wasn't much, but after a couple of handfuls, maybe the water would loosen up whatever... My fingers were in the wall a little bit now. It sounds impossible, I know, but when I first got stuck, it had just been the tips of my index finger and thumb that were touching the wall. By the time I was rubbing and splashing toilet water on them, both fingers were sunken a little, like they were being absorbed a millimeter at a time. The wall was touching my thumbnail now, too, and my index finger was in a quarter of the way to my first knuckle. I started yanking again, but I was screaming now too, screaming my head off for someone to come help me. I didn't care anymore if they knew I'd been marking on the wall. I'd pay for the damage. I'd buy the whole new wall if this one would just let me go. Another minute or two passes without me getting free or anyone coming. That's when it hits me. I never really saw anyone when I went inside. I wasn't paying attention. I was focused on needing to pee. But had anyone been at the counters or aisles I'd passed? What if no one was in the store at all? I looked back to my fingers. It was hard to tell, but I thought they'd sunk in more. It was strange. It didn't hurt. My fingertips just felt kind of numb, and I only hurt when I tried yanking them free. I suddenly had the image of a man of war sliding over a terrified fish and eating it slowly. I felt like I might vomit, but instead I grabbed my wrist, put my feet up on the back of the urinal, and pushed off until I hit the floor. I was bleeding freely then, and there was plenty of pain. I ripped off my index and thumb's fingernail, a good chunk of meat too, but at the moment I didn't care. I was busy getting on my feet and running past the mini maze of walls back to the store, the front of the store, and out the door to my car. It wasn't until two exits away and starting to get lightheaded that I made myself stop, go into a pharmacy, and get some stuff to clean up. I wound up getting a motel after that. When I got to my sister's the next day, I told her I'd been an idiot and slammed my fingers in the car door. She made me go to the doctor, of course, and after a few months, my nails grew back and my skin... Well, my fingers aren't pretty, but they healed up okay. I... I never told anyone what really happened. It kind of fucked me up, you know? It was a year before I could make myself go into a public bathroom, and even then I was very leery of touching anything, especially the walls, but I'm not crazy. After a while, when nothing else ever happened, I got over it mostly. Decided it was either one of those weird freak things that happens to people sometimes, or that I dreamt it while driving half asleep. I knew that from my fingers being jacked up, something had happened, but maybe I really had just slammed them in the door after all. It was last year, the week before my birthday, when I went into a bathroom stall at a movie theater and closed the door. I'd used a stall a couple of times before that point, but I still tried to ignore any of the messages around me. This time, I was sitting there long enough that my mind and eyes started to wander. Before long, they landed on a message on the back of the door. 
Long time no see, Pete. I was out in the car before I even called my girlfriend to come outside. I told her I'd gotten sick and we'd have to see the movie another time. She was worried and a little pissed, but she could tell that something was wrong when she got into the car. Well, we didn't go out for long after that, and I made a promise to myself that I wasn't ever going into a public bathroom again. You know how hard that is. It sounds trivial, maybe, but how often do you need to use the bathroom on a trip, or at a restaurant, or even at work? I got to where I rarely went anywhere, and I'd hold it when I was at work. The few times I just couldn't wait, I'd have to go home or just piss behind the old shopping center that was nearby. It was a few more months before the inconvenience of it all started to get to me. I told myself that I'd only seen the messages at a gas station and a movie theater, so maybe work was safe. It wasn't just a place I visited, after all. So I started going at work again. First couple of weeks, everything was fine. I was even starting to consider eating lunch with friends from work again. Maybe it couldn't find me in restaurants either, and stop for a moment there. Pete fell silent as he looked at me with a mixture of irritation and confusion. Giving him a smile, I went on. I'm not trying to interrupt, but I think we've just hit on a key point. You said it wouldn't find me. That sounds like you decided that at that point, someone or something was after you, persecuting or hunting you. Is that right? Rubbing at the bandage on his arm, he frowned at me. <laughs> well, not to be rude, but no shit. I mean, I, I didn't think it was some dude stalking me and writing me messages before I went to use the bathroom, but I also didn't think it was a coincidence that two messages with my name just happened to be where I'd see them, especially when I'd been avoiding bathrooms for months. Trying not to sound too sarcastic, I gave a nod as I responded. I see your point. But, what did you think it was? A bathroom ghost? Pete rolled his eyes. I, I don't know. I, I wanted to believe it wasn't real, you know? Or if it was real, it was limited to certain places or something. And I started to trick myself that that was true. But when I was reaching for some toilet paper in the stall one day, and the back of my hand brushed the stall wall, it stuck there. Just like in the gas station. Shaking his head, Pete's voice began to tremble as he went on. I panicked, of course. I started pulling in my hand. I would have torn the whole stall down if I had to, job or no job, but then I noticed a funny sound near my head. I turned and watched as the words began to appear in the side of the stall. You're a tasty boy, Pete. I think I did go a little crazy just then for a moment because I should have tore my hand free and left. Instead, I got a pen out of my pocket. It was awkward because I was in that kind of stooped over crouch when you're getting paper to wipe in the stall and I was terrified of touching anything else, but I also wanted to end it all. Or at least to understand. So I carefully put the pen to the wall without letting any other part of me touch and wrote out a question. What are you? I pulled the pen away without any problem, and the answer, if it was an answer, was being scratched in under what I wrote just a couple of seconds later, a single word. Sarcophagus. I didn't know what that meant exactly, but I took it to mean this was going to be my coffin. That was enough to get me to rip free and run out of that bathroom as fast as I could go. I lost the job, of course. Running through the office with your pants half down, crying and bleeding everywhere. It's not like I could blame them. Sighing, I stopped writing a note to look up and meet his gaze. Pete, I know that's been hard on you. 
mental health issues are nothing to be ashamed of, but that doesn't mean we don't feel ashamed, especially when it affects our work and relationships. It can feel very lonely, but trust me, you're not a... Trust me. I don't feel alone. This thing, whatever it is, it's still tracking me, even at home now, though it still hasn't gone out of the bathroom for some reason. I don't know if that's some limit it has... Or if it's just fucking with me. It likes that, you know? It wants me to know it can get me, but it also wants me to think I have a chance to beat it. Easier to hurt me and drive me crazy if I still have some hope, right? Pete, I know this may feel hopeless, but it's not. And turning your frustration and anger onto yourself, it's very unhealthy. That's why you're here, right? I gestured at the bandage on his right elbow and left ear, the scar on the back of his right hand and fingertips. And those were just the ones that I could see. I knew from his records he was also missing patches of skin from his left buttock and lower shoulder blade. He glared at me. I'm here because my sister, God bless her, thinks I'm a cutter or that I'm going to kill myself. And if I don't agree to have these voluntary sessions, she's already talked to a lawyer about non-voluntary committal. She doesn't understand that I've spent the last three years trying not to get hurt and get away from this thing. I raised an eyebrow. Did you tell her about this? This entity that you think is after you? Pete shook his head. I already told you I didn't. I haven't told anyone before. I know it all sounds crazy, and I know no one can help. They would have just had locked me up quicker and made it easier for it to get me. Leaning forward, I gave him a slight smile. Then why tell me all this now? Lowering his eyes, he gave a shrug. Because I'm tired. I'm so fucking tired. Tired of trying to run from it or beat it. It's not stupid. It still talks to me sometimes. But it's just to scare me. Get me to slip up or give up or act crazy. Run me toward... He gestured toward me before letting his hand fall dejectedly back into his lap. This, I guess. A locked door or a padded cell, some corner I can't get out of until the walls close in and it can swallow me whole. Sitting aside my pad and pen, I leaned forward. Peter, I know this may all feel like a trap or some bad path, but nothing could be further from the truth. You have people that care about you, and I promise... If you will give yourself over to the process, a year from now, you'll look back and... I need to go take a piss. I sat back in my chair. Pete, we still have half an hour in today's session. I know you may want to go home, but if you can hold it for a bit longer than maybe... No, it's okay. I can go here. You got a bathroom, right? Blinking, I stared at him a moment, trying to weigh a response. I do, yeah. But, are you sure? I thought you didn't use public bathrooms. Clearing my throat, I decided to go on. In fact, haven't you gone to urinating and defecating in buckets in the yard the last few weeks? I think that's one of the things your sister... He waved his hand as he stood up, his face hard and unreadable. Ah, you're right. I've been acting crazy. I guess I am crazy, right? If I'm crazy, then there's no harm in me just going and using your bathroom like a normal person, right? I felt my throat growing tight. I, um... Yeah, sure, if you want to. But you need to understand, I'm trusting you with this. If you go in there and hurt yourself, that's a breach of that trust, and it makes it harder for this not to head toward more restrictions until we can get you to a point where we know you're safe. His expression was strange when he met my eyes. No worries, Doc. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just tired. I'm just tired and I need to take a piss. No, 
Nodding slowly, I pointed toward the lobby. First door on the other side of reception. He turned and walked with the same odd shuffle he'd came in again. A painful catch in his movement from too many pieces being taken here and there. Twenty-five. The kid walked like an old man. I watched him make his way past the front window and into the bathroom, and I gave him about five minutes before I started getting nervous. There had been no noises or other signs of him doing something to himself in there, but that didn't necessarily mean much. I didn't need a client hurting or killing themselves in my bathroom. It wouldn't hurt to just knock and check on him, would it? I tried to keep my voice even as I knocked on the bathroom door. Pete? Everything okay in there? I waited and listened for a response or some kind of movement. Nothing. I knocked again, my voice louder and sterner this time. Pete, please answer or I'll have to come in and check on you. Still, no answer. And when I tried the knob, the door was locked. Cursing under my breath, I stepped back into the counter and looked at Cynthia. Give me the key, please. Wide eye, she nodded and pulled the bathroom key from the desk drawer. Stepping back over, I unlocked the door, ready to either yell at him or call 911, depending on what Pete had done to himself. The bathroom was empty. I stepped back out to the front desk. Did that guy leave? I'd been watching the hall on and off while he was gone to the bathroom, but maybe he'd still snuck past. She shook her head. No, I, I don't see how. I would have seen him. And the front door would have chimed. I never saw him leave the bathroom, Cynthia frowned. He's not there? I grimaced at her. Obviously not. I... Sorry, just... Call down to the building security desk and make sure they haven't seen him. And give me the number of his sister. It's the billing contact. Shaking my head, I went back to the bathroom. It was still empty. Had he hidden behind the door? No, there wasn't enough room. And there was no window or ceiling panels for him to get out, so... Then where was... It was then I noticed it. On the wall behind the toilet. Scratched deep into the otherwise unblemished plum-colored paint I'd picked out when we repainted last year. A single line of a slashing answer of greeting or farewell or threat. I wanted to reach out and touch it, and yet I somehow didn't quite dare. Instead, I just read it again before backing slowly out of the too small room. Pete was here. Quick word of warning, the last story for tonight has um, some pretty extreme descriptions of binge like binging on drugs and alcohol. Um, if it's something that you're not comfortable listening to, for whatever reason, totally understandable. There are plenty of other videos on the channel that you could go listen to. There's a playlist on the channel that you can check out. Just wanted to let everyone know, just in case you're uncomfortable with that subject matter. It may be hard to believe, but before I became the bloated old drunk you'd see camping outside your local liquor store, I used to be quite the stud back in my prime. I was young, athletic, had a full set of long sandy hair and a jawline so sharp it could cut glass. When I wasn't pumping iron in the gym, I was probably out there pumping somebody's wife. What can I say? It was the 80s, and I'm from the West Hollywood. Debauchery was sort of the norm back then. After I flunked college and my parents practically disowned me, my life became a self-perpetuating spiral of... Women, drugs, alcohol, and glam metal. The parties were wild and sobriety was a sin, and I wouldn't have it any other way. 
I couldn't tell you where or how we first met. Could have been at a bar, street corner, or nightclub. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. Her name was Rachel. She wasn't the most gorgeous woman I'd ever seen or anything like that. Curly brown hair, plaid skirt, thick rimmed glasses. Everything about her was so incredibly mediocre that it seemed almost deliberate, as though she'd gone to excessive lengths not to stand out in a crowd. Following a night of fittingly average sex, imagine my surprise when she suddenly turned around and said to me, You want to join a cult? Upon processing the unconventional and unusually candid proposal, a sensible person would have likely responded with a very definitive hell no. I, however, wasn't, and never had been, a sensible man. As evident by the fact that I didn't immediately gather my clothes and head for the door. I was taken aback, sure, but I'd be lying if I said that my morbid curiosity wasn't piqued. It was the sheer novelty of the experience that intrigued me. I was still in that period of early adulthood when you feel like nothing can touch you, so you hop from thrill to thrill regardless of any potential consequences. Besides, I figured that it couldn't have been anything that malicious given how casual she was about it. And so, around 10pm the following day, there I was, standing in the middle of a parking lot outside of town. Before me was an old warehouse that should have been equally as abandoned, and yet there were lights and faint music emanating from somewhere within its bowels. I narrowed my eyes and stepped toward the neglected structure. Although surprisingly intact, the windows were made of thick, semi-transparent glass. I could only see vague shapes moving about the illuminated interior. I bypassed the set of doors that looked to have rusted shut, and instead made my way over to the opposite side of the property. Sure enough, hidden behind several overflowing dumpsters and a mound of scrap metal was another door. There was something scribbled on it with bright pink graffiti. Enlightenment through excess. Deliverance through pleasure. It sure seemed like the right place. I walked up to the alternate entrance and pressed my knuckles to its corroded surface, knocking twice as per Rachel's instructions. After a few tense seconds, the bottom of the heavy steel door scraped against the concrete as it got yanked ajar. A single, monolid eye stared back at me through the gap. Judging by what little I could see of the woman's expression, she definitely liked what she saw. Evening, hot stuff. You got a password for me? Right, uh, yeah. Uh, Lord of the Flies? I answered quizzically. Her lips formed into a playful grin, or at least the half of one. I instinctively stepped back as the thick fingers of a man emerged from the narrow slit, gripping the side of the door and pulling it wide open. The squealing of its unoiled hinges caused me to grit my teeth. Standing on the other side of that threshold, bathed in the ambient glow radiating from within, was a giant. I wasn't a wimp myself, but the leather-clad viking looked capable of breaking every bone in my six-foot-one frame and wearing my limp body like a scarf. Leaning against him was the young Asian woman, still bearing that same grin. With her neon green lipstick, fishnet outfit, and rainbow pigtails, she was the personification of the stereotypical rave-goer quite the contrast to her stoic, heavily tattooed counterpart. She beckoned me down the dimly lit hallway behind her, and then through what appeared to have been once a cafeteria. The laughter and the music were getting louder. We eventually came up to yet another door, this one decorated in various outdated safety tips and warnings directed at the staff that used to work here. My colorful guide placed her hand on the handle and winked back at me before pushing it down. Have fun! Awaiting me on the other side was what I can only describe as a cesspool of degeneracy. Bodies on top of bodies, writhing, moaning, fucking like the end of the world was nigh, much to the enjoyment of the clearly intoxicated onlookers. 
What passed as a dance floor was littered with clothes and empty bottles. Cheap perfume intermixed with sweat polluted the stagnant air. The sickeningly sweet concoction made me feel lightheaded. My skin pulsated in tune with the generic synth-pop beat that poured from the speakers, which only partially masked the sound of the flesh slapping against flesh. Rachel was there, too, sandwiched between two jocks and reduced to a babbling, drooling mess. I guess she'd been holding out on me, or perhaps the unassuming persona was a means of luring people. It wasn't long until I got added to the vigorous orgy, courtesy of an eager redhead grabbing me by the crotch. Before I knew it, she had unbuckled my belt and was dragging me down with her. After the spree of indulgence had reached its inevitable climax, both figuratively and literally, everyone's attention fell squarely on me. Rachel, in particular, seemed quite pleased that I decided to show up. She was the first to officially welcome me into the House of Exorbitance, and then reveal herself as the cult's de facto leader. Their mission, as she explained it to me, was simple. Enjoy life to its fullest until you no longer can, and then go out in a blaze of glory. She went on to assure me that there was no pressure on becoming a full-fledged member just yet, and that I was free to attend their annual group activities whenever I felt like it. And so, for a while, that's what I did. As fun as the free booze and rampant sex were, it was actually the sense of community that kept me coming back. Like me, all of them were failures and outcasts who just wanted to have a good time. I was introduced to new experiences, taken to places that I'd never been before, partook in a drugful, pseudo-intellectual discussions until the wee hours of the morning. It came as a surprise to no one when I expressed interest in formally joining just a few months later. The initiation ceremony was very much on brand. I was to get high off my ass and hit as many clubs as I can, getting progressively more inebriated until I could no longer remember my own name. The night melted into a soup of bright colors and forbidden sensations. The city, she's a fickle bitch. She makes a young man feel like the king of Sunset Strip one moment, and then like a vagabond the next. She promises him the world, only reduce him to another junkie wandering her neon-lit streets looking for his next fix. And then, when he's at his most vulnerable and pathetic, she casts a spotlight on him and tells him to dance. And I danced. Boy, oh boy, did I fucking dance. I danced until my legs gave out, and then I danced some more, all for the amusement of the other lost souls damned to this plane of vice and glamour. I genuinely have no idea how I ended up in the back of that taxi. The driver, a dark man with slicked curly hair and pencil-thin mustache, was looking at me through the rearview mirror. I found it odd that he was wearing sunglasses, despite it being pitch black outside. Where to, son? He asked with his deep, baritone voice. My face felt numb. It was like I had someone else's lips sewn on top of my own. Home was all that I could think to say. The man flashed me a pitying smile. He placed one hand on the steering wheel and adjusted the radio with the other. His voice blended with the smooth jazz. Right on. I pressed my forehead to the cold glass, observing the lights as they slipped by. I wasn't exactly sober yet. Certain colors still appeared more saturated than they should have, but the fact that I could formulate coherent thoughts was nothing short of a miracle, considering the cocktail of substances circulating through my system. As we reached our first stoplight, the man glanced back at me once more. So, how's Rachel? She treating you well? Surprised, I rubbed the haze from my eyes and met his curious yet knowing reflection. You remember the house, too? I don't think I've seen you before. The man chuckled. (laughs) Yeah, that's sort of the point. Think of me as the sponsor of your little club. A concerned benefactor, if you will. My friends call me Bub, 
and I do hope we can be friends. Sponsor? I willlessly inquired. The man sunk back against his leather chair and tapped his fingers on the mahogany desk that now separated us. The scenes had shifted to an office space, complete with drab wallpaper and minimalist decor. The abrupt transition might seem jarring in hindsight, but it somehow felt natural at the time. It was as if reality was suddenly running on dream logic, and much like a dream, one rarely stops and questions its authenticity. That's right. The booze, the drugs, most of the girls, all paid for by yours truly. Uh, but that's just an appetizer. The driver, now donning the skin of a shrewd businessman, took a whiff from his cigar and nudged a stack of papers my way. They slid across the polished surface with little resistance, forcing me to catch them before they fell. It's all there. You can read it if you want. Standard membership is ten years. Just sign your name on the dotted line and you get a whole decade to live your life the way you've always wanted, free of responsibilities. Think about it, brother. The party never has to stop. I examined the contract. It was written in what looked like foreign scripture, yet I could still understand it as though it were plain English, the words warping as I read them. I tossed the papers back on the table and they slapped against the wet asphalt instead. And what happens after that? I asked with an understandable degree of skepticism. The mysterious man who had identified himself as Bub rubbed his chin. The headlights of passing cars briefly illuminated his features as the ever-fluctuating scenery remolded itself around us once more, I found myself staring in the middle of a dank alleyway. Rain dribbled from the sky, accumulating in greasy ponds of diluted grime and filth, as clouds of rising fog enveloped us both. It was a frame straight out of an old noir film. You ask a lot of questions, don't you? That's good. I like that. The man remarked before lowering his sunglasses and revealing the pair of unsettingly blue eyes concealed beneath. I felt cold just looking at them. The price is firm. Once your membership is up, I get your soul. Simple as that. He explained with a casual enthusiasm of a used car salesman. I looked down at the stack of papers lying at my feet. The rain was starting to soak through the pages, smudging some of the ink. I pressed the man further. So I get to party for ten years and then spend an eternity in hell? I'll be honest, it doesn't sound like that great of a deal. Bub's bellowing laughter echoed across the sea. We were now standing on a pier side by side instead of facing each other. The purple sun was starting to rise on the horizon, dyeing the sky in shades of pink. I saw a herd of zebras run across the still water. One of the animals halted and turned toward me, peering at me through the vertically yellow eye in the middle of its head before trotting off as well. I couldn't help but be entranced by the psychedelic vista unfolding before us. It's not how it works, son. Once you're gone, you're gone. Lights out. There are no pearly gates or fire and brimstone waiting for you on the other side. Your soul returns to the big old great cosmic soup. All I want to do is to put it some actual use. Think of it like donating an organ. If it makes you feel any better. The man reached inside his suit jacket and produced what looked to be a Polaroid, then proceeded to wave it in my face. All right, he said. Here's my final offer. You get 20 years to do whatever you want. I'm talking complete financial independence without ever having to lift a finger, and if you're smart with it, a lot more than that. By the time you're 40, you could still be snorting blow off the tits of some model half your age, but there is a condition. He handed me a photo. It was a shot of Ico. The flirty Asian girl usually manages the door along with her behemoth of a boyfriend. Scribbled on the back of the picture was an address. Bub was quick to allay my concerns. All I need you to do is deliver the package. Nothing more. 
Once you do that, I'll consider our deal finalized. I do it myself, but I like maintaining a more hands-off approach, if you know what I mean. I chewed on the inside of my cheek and glanced back at the rear door glass. We were parked outside of my rundown apartment complex. I exchanged a nod with the driver and promptly exited the taxi. As I ascended the steps to my room, wondering how much of our conversation was just the byproduct of a bad trip, I spotted a small cardboard box placed on my doorstep. It was taped shut and had Iko's address written on it once more, along with a big Do Not Open sticker addressed to me. Now, to most of you reading this, a decade or two of unbridled decadence might seem like an incredibly short time to be trading your soul for, but to a dropout and all-around meathead like myself who always thought they wouldn't live long enough to see their 30s, the proposal was actually quite tempting. Since joining the Colts, my increasingly hedonistic lifestyle had prevented me from holding down jobs and the bills were piling up. I was weeks away from getting evicted. In the end, I decided that this literally once-in-a-lifetime opportunity was simply too good to pass up. So I did exactly what was asked of me the very next morning. The first check from my mysterious benefactor arrived shortly after, and let's just say that the sum was more than substantial. We never saw Aiko or her boyfriend again. After a while, I didn't even need the Colts anymore. Why go to a grimy warehouse to get my rocks off when I can host parties on my private yacht full of high-class escorts? To say that I was living at large would have been an understatement. I bought casinos, hotels, an island in the Caribbean, all because I could. And then, in the early 2000s, it all came crashing down. From one of the most prominent playboys in Hollywood, I became a nobody almost overnight. My bank accounts were drained, my properties seized. Predictably, my wife left me soon after and took what remaining assets I had with her. I've been living off my dead parents' savings and the occasional handout ever since. Honestly, I'm surprised that I'm still kicking in spite of it all. Though, that won't be the case for long. Yesterday, I received a package from an unknown sender, not unlike the one that I delivered all those years ago. It's currently sitting next to me. In it is a revolver with a single bullet in the chamber and a note attached to it. The note reads, Dear Luke, Your membership has expired and your payment is way overdue. The House of Exorbitance has been lenient with you thus far, but the time has come to collect. I trust you won't disappoint me. Your friend, Bub. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to these stories tonight. I hope you enjoy them as much as I did. I think out of the two, my favorite was probably number one. The author managed to take something as mundane as using a public restroom and turn it into an absolute living nightmare. Um, I don't think I will ever be using a public restroom ever again. Just, I I know I'm not going to get pulled into the wall, but, you know, what if? What if? As far as the second story... Never had any plans on joining a cult, so I don't think I'll be in that situation anytime soon. Let me know what you thought about the stories down below in the comments. And also, I wanted to give a quick thank you to all of our $5 patrons and members. If you want a shout out at the end of the video, like all the people you're about to hear, you can become a $5 patron or a $5 member over here on YouTube. Either one will get you the same thing, it's just on a different site. Some people don't like leaving YouTube, which is fine. Uh, you'll get videos a day or two days early, and you'll also get your name shouted out at the end of a video. If you pledge just $1 a month on either site, it also gets you videos early, but no shout out. So, if it's something you're interested in, there are links down below. But enough of that, I want to thank everyone who is pledging. 
That is Absinthe Alice, Alice E, Amethyst, Amet, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, LSG, Furious Weasel, If in Doubt, Flat Out, Jesse, Jess, Jess, Justinia Zaromsky, Karen Parrott, Kat, Kathy Flanning, Lee Riggs, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Mindy Bannon, Moon Potato, Nicholas Moore, Nikki Parsons, Nora, Nova Nocturne, Patricia Rodea, Ray Clegg, Centennial, The New Ongoing 24, Tiger Princess, Triumph, and Victoria Step. Thank you all for the amazing continued support. I really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone who sticks, sticks around and watches all these videos. So take care, everyone. Hope you have a wonderful night, evening, or afternoon, wherever you are. And as always, take care of yourselves. Thank you.